Good morning, everybody. Welcome to class today on Tuesday, June 30th, last day of June, and then we start July. So we're getting really close to the end, at least of summer, too. So that's pretty good. All right, then. Oh, well, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Enjoy some knowledge as your birthday, I guess. I guess I'll put here a happy birthday. I should probably put at least part of your name. I'll put the, the king part since I think you also have that in Discord. Otherwise, they'll think it's my birthday, which is not. So, Cool. All right, then. Well, uh, it's a happy day today, I guess. So last time we were talking about searching, and then we kind of rushed into it. So I'll cover that again a little bit, and then we will jump into sorting. I'll first talk about bubble sort, which is the most simplest, straightforward as you're welcome. Sort. And then from there, I'll show you binary search. So we'll switch back gears into, into searching from there. And then, um, I don't know, at that time, it might be the end of the class. If it's not, then I'll show you more sort algorithms. Uh, maybe code some, maybe not. Depends on how long we have. So we'll go and take it from there. So let's go ahead and uh, move over here. Okay, cool. All right, so this is the code that we had last time. I did add a couple of comments here uh, just to remind you what it does and to remind me what it does next time I looked at the code. And so first we declared a vector just because why not instead of an array, it's cooler. Uh, then we were using RAND because the idea of what we were doing was to create a little mini game of guess the right number kind of thing. Or actually guess if the number is in the list uh, game. So we had 10 numbers in the list. And there's a possible combination of technically 20 numbers, I suppose, because they can go from 0 to 19. But since there's 10, it kind of boils down to about a 50-50 chance of you guessing a number that's there or not. So that's a pretty good odds. They're better than Vegas odds. So, yeah. Um, and then basically how we achieve that is we have a little vector that's going to store the numbers. We use RAND to randomly generate the numbers. And the way we do it is we have a little for loop that runs 10 times. And then each of those times we push back a number. And how do we generate a random number? Uh, it turns out that we use RAND mod 20. There goes my dog. And so technically, the, the, the I was kind of thinking about the math behind this and how it really works. You will have to take 251 or 351 math to uh, understand the real odds of this because it's not as easy as 50-50. It turns out that this is a combination problem, uh, combinatronic problem, sorry, because you can't get the same number more than once. Rand could return to you the same number twice. I mean, it could actually return to you the same number 20, 10 times because you're calling 10 times. Now, the odds of that are pretty low, but I do believe that the way you have to do this is you have to take the total numbers and divide it by like factorial or something. I can't remember. It's it's a, it's either a combination or permutation problem, and I always get those mixed up. But uh, I can Google and leave you guys a link for that, combination and permutation. And if you take math, I think it's 351. 251 is discrete math one, and 351 is discrete math two. In one of those, and I do think it's the second one, they will go over this kind of math. And it's not actually uh, necessarily hard, at least in comparison to other math that there is. This is definitely on the, uh, I'd say, easier side, if there is such a thing for math. But uh, you can read about that there. Let's see if I can remember which one's which. Oh, here we go. So, so permutations, repetition is allowed. There we go. So combinations, I assume, is the one where, oh, no, repetitions are also allowed. Um, hold on a second. There are two kinds of combinations. Damn it. So it's okay. So which one is which then? Permutation? I don't, I don't know. A permutation is an ordered combination. Ah, okay. Then we want combinations because it's unordered probably. This is how lotteries work. Yeah, so I guess, remember the order does not matter. Yeah, okay, the order doesn't matter, and it doesn't in our case. So 
Okay, so, so this is a combinations problem. And then there should be a formula for that. Yes, it's n factorial, r factorial times n minus r factorial. That's the formula you want to remember. So um, if we were really curious about what this probability would be, it would actually be, in this case, what is r? Um, and is a number of things to choose from, and we choose r of them. So technically, we have 20 numbers, and we choose 10 of them. But we have repetitions, so we want to use the top formula. Hmm. And choose R. So basically, 20 choose 3, I said 20 choose 10 in our case. So 20 factorial divided by 3 factorial minus 20 minus 10. So that would be. 10 so, so basically we would be doing 20 factorial divided by 10 factorial times 10 factorial i think that will be the solution to our problem times 10 factorial let's see if this will actually read it mm, hold on need parentheses here i'm doing the math in google to see what it is no that did not give us a good answer so i don't know you guys can figure that out on your own or when you take the class you can, um the math class so yes anyways i should have should have thought about actually researching this beforehand but it's okay so anyways it's not really 50 50 but it's close enough for government work so yeah anyways so our game you know we're, we're kind of hoping it's 50 50 but again it's a little bit uh, different than that um, and so ultimately what we want to do is we want to ask the user to enter a number and then this is going to be the searching part. We need to look for the number in the list we generated above here. The list we generated is in vector and it has 10 things in it. And basically what we need to do is we need to look through this list to see if the number that we guess is in the list, in which case you, uh, you win per se. Okay. So, and there's also that probability as well, that any of the 10 numbers could have your number as well. So that, this is a quite a complicated problem actually. So yeah, if we want to calculate like the actual probability. So anyways, how do you search through something? That's kind of the topic of the day and what we really need to understand. So usually when you're searching through something, you need to know what you're searching in. So the most typical thing where you, that, that you're going to be using to search is going to be some kind of list. And by list in the C++, we are talking about an array or a vector. And eventually when you learn about linked list, a linked list as well. But that one we're not going to focus on today. But I, I think I'm going to show you very briefly what, the, what, what that was uh, yesterday. So before we make any, uh, um, before we start, you know, we need to make a couple of assumptions here. And that is what information is in the list that we're looking for? Is it, is it going to be a one-to-one -one match or is it going to be something that doesn't matter, that only uh, like partially matches? So like when you're Googling something, Google doesn't just look for a one-to-one -one match. It actually looks for similar things that may be spelled differently because you might have made a spelling issue or also just because it increases the amount of things that it can suggest to you, right? So you also need to figure that out. So searching can be a very, very, very uh, complicated problem. But we're gonna start with the easiest possible thing, which is you're searching for exact matches. Furthermore, because your data is on a list and in this case we're going to go with a one-dimensional list although if it was two dimensionals it doesn't matter because you can just sort of flatten the thing and look through the whole thing so with one dimensions if, I, if you know by nature if i if i have a list of something if I, have a, if, if I just have this and there's and this is just like a little chart and i'm looking through for a name in the chart and the chart is for names what do I normally do with a case like that? I start looking from the top to the bottom and I just scan the entire thing line by line. And if I find what I'm looking for, then I'm in business. If I don't, then I say it's not found. Or maybe I look again if, to see if I didn't miss it, you know, because humans, we could miss a line. Whereas a computer, you can know that for sure that it's very thorough. And the first time it looks, if it doesn't find something, then it's for sure not there, right? That's kind of like the difference between us and the computers. That's basically all there is. And that is called linear search because you're because of two things technically there is this concept of time complexity in computer science which is how we actually compare whether my algorithm to do something is faster 
the neural algorithm to do something. And we call that big O notation. And you will learn about that in, in, data, in data structures, which is CS302. But when you're searching through something and you need to search through each individual item of what you're searching for, we consider that to be linear time because it's gonna take the amount of lines you can think of it that there are in this thing, you're gonna search through each line. And so you're searching in a linear fashion because you're going one by one, line by line. And that's kind of where the concept of linear comes from. And how long does that take? Well, suppose that there are 100 items in your list and each of those takes one second to look through because you read a little bit slow or whatever. In this case, if it's one second per line and there's 100 lines, then it's going to take you 100 seconds, right? If it, if, it, if it takes you half a second to read one line and there's 100 lines, then that takes you 50 seconds because it's 100 divided by, or technically 100 times 0.5 which can be reduced basically to 100 divided by 2, which is just 50, right? So you multiply the number of items you have times how long it takes you to look through each item. And that's really how time complexity works, uh, even in the 302 level. That's all you're really doing is you're, you're figuring out how long it takes to do one step of the process, and then you just got to figure out how many of these steps you have to take. And then that tells you the overall time that it takes to perform the function that you're doing whether it's searching, searching, sorting, or whatever you're actually doing technically. So with linear search, the time something takes is going to be strictly related, you know, one-to-one -one technically, to the size of the data. The more data you have to look for, the longer it takes. Now, in my example, if I told you that instead of being 100 uh, lines to look for, there's 10 billion of them, and it's it's, it takes you one second for each of them, that's going to be 10 billion seconds potentially. That's much longer than I would want to spend searching through something. And that's when we, of course, turn to a computer to help us to search through data, right? But even computers take time to do something. And so it turns out that a lot of the times we hear in the media or uh, in general from people that computers are amazingly fast and they can do so much things in so little time. Well, I'm here to tell you that while there is a certain truth to that, it's not as easy as just telling it to do something and then it just does it super fast. The computers have limits too. And computers are not as fast as, as, as people usually think of them as being. It turns out that if you give it large enough data, a computer, and you give it something like linear search where it's just looking line by line, computer will take some time to do that. It's not going to do that immediately. It may take hours, days, or even years to do something which is not exactly fast by any means to do search data in years. And so it turns out that when you have a time complexity of N, which is essentially linear time, which means the, the size, the, the time it takes is basically equal to the, the number of items you're searching. So if, if, it, if it takes one second for one thing and you have 10 things, you can do that multiplication just one times 10. If you're doing something in that sort of linear time, that may not be fast enough for what you're trying to do to be done in, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. And so algorithms are more than just getting a job done. You have to actually consider how fast they get it done. There are algorithms that take longer than linear time, by the way. There are algorithms that take what we call n squared time. What does that mean, n squared? Well, that means normally we're saying one times the number of items, right? So if you, if you take one second per comparison, when you got 10 items, that's 10 seconds. When we're talking about n squared, we're saying one, you still take one second per item, but now here's the thing. The number of items, you have to square that number before you multiply it times one. So if you have 10 items, in reality, what's gonna end up being is you're gonna take 100 seconds. So whereas with 10 items in linear time, you would've taken 10 seconds, now you're gonna take 100 seconds for 10 items. And there are algorithms that are slower. Obviously, that doesn't really apply for, for searching because searching, you can just go through the entire list and there's no reason to take longer than that. But some algorithms, for example, sorting, and the one that I'm gonna show you, bubble sort, take n squared time to, to, uh, to achieve that. And is it really good? Well, not really because uh, with, with data around the range of something like uh, 50,000 items, even the computer is gonna be taking like five minutes just to sort that data. And that's a really long time actually. 
in tool two i actually made them sort i think about fifty thousand items using bubble sort and it took about five minutes for sally to run it now you can imagine all students trying to run on sally the same thing that just killed sally i think it crashed or it just slowed down to a grindly painful like speed of like it was taking like one hour to run the sort so yeah computers have limits too and you, you want to consider that when you're developing algorithms now there are fa faster than linear time algorithms you can actually search through a list faster than linear time a computer can at least and you can too technically that's what we we're going to talk about when i mentioned binary search today so Normally, linear time, you have to look through everything top to bottom, right? But you can take advantages of manipulating the list in a certain way that you can search through it faster than having to look through every single item to check whether something is there or not. There is a catch, though. Manipulating that data in a way that you can search faster than linear time also takes time to do. So that manipulation also takes time. And that time is actually going to be a longer than, would, than if you would just have searched through it linearly. So if all you gotta do is search for one item in the list, it makes more sense to just look top to bottom linear, linear search style, then to do some fancy manipulation to the list so that you can search for that item in less than linear time. However, if you have a lot of data, but you intend to do a lot of searching through this data, that's when it makes sense to manipulate the data in a certain way that makes you search faster than linear time because you're gonna once you once you get to that hurdle of organizing the data in a way that you can search through it faster, then you're good. Now, this isn't something really uh, strictly connected to computers. People do this all the time. You know, when you go to the library, imagine if you just had to if, if you just got to the library and they said, uh, "I'm looking for uh, the Odyssey." or Oedipus Rex, I don't know. And so you go in there and, and they tell you, yeah, it's in that, in that pile of books. And you just see this massive pile that's literally like ceiling height. Well, good luck finding it. But you know what? Once you do find it, you're good to go, right? And you don't ever need to look through that pile again. It makes more sense to go to that pain, painstaking process of finding it in that pile then if you just said, oh no, let me just create an entire organized library, organize all the books in the entire library just to find one book. That is nonsense. That's gonna take way longer actually to do. However, you know, when we go to libraries, we don't see stacks of books it just piled up, right? They're organized and they're organized alphabetically and within categories as well. That's the thing. That, organiza that initial organization took a lot of work and time However, now I can go to the library, I can ask where a book is located, and then they tell me the section, and then from there I can just perform linear search on just a tiny subset of the entire library, right? So that initial organization took a lot of work and time, but then follow up searching of the data, basically following, locating stuff is a lot faster, right? So if the data you're working with is data that you want to basically access quickly, Yes, it, it makes sense to take that extra time to organize the data so that you can then quickly access it. And technically, I suppose the way that libraries work is a little bit like a hash table because it's, it's very fast because they know exactly where everything is technically. Uh, so that's even faster. That's, that's instant time actually versus linear time or even smaller than linear time, which the one that I will show you today is log of n time, which is logarithmic base 10 or sorry base 2 time and that's what I'll show you today now how can we achieve that the same way the library does it you sort the data sorting the data allows you to search faster through it because once it's sorted you you can better control where information is stored and predict that so I'll stop there I'll talk more about it when we get to binary search but that's going to be kind of like the goal of, the, of, of sorting is usually to make data easier to find and faster to find than linear search okay so that's the whole spiel behind that we spend about a month of, on, on, on maybe three weeks not a month or how long do we spend yeah i think three weeks we spend in data structures talking about sorting in general so of course how much can i cover in 3135 because that's what it is and then they have a big assignment on that as well so We'll cover a little bit, but the real meat of the content is gonna come when you take data structures if you're a computer science student, which is CS302. Uh, 
which usually I'm the one that teaches. So I shall see you again then, unless you take it in the summer where I don't teach it. I mean, I could, but I'm teaching this, so yeah. All right. So um, let's, yeah, I mean, I was going to write stuff on the tablet, but we actually don't need to. We can just hop on in and write this. So let's go ahead and run this program. Um, so you can see it if you don't remember it. And so it enters a guess. So we're going to put in a guess of eight. And you can see that it did not find it. I actually reformatted this. Last time it was just printing them line in an entire like line number, one number per line. Now I switched it to just printed everything horizontal because it looks nicer and easier to, to, to see the numbers. Actually, maybe this is harder way to, harder to search for the numbers, but you can see that eight is not found. So how do we actually do this? It's not that hard at this point. Linear search is a very easy concept. All you gotta do is loop through the entire list. And by list, again, it can be a vector, it can be array. I'm using list disorders as a generic term. You loop through the entire list or data structure and just look through each individual entry. And, you, and the way you do that is you compare what you're looking for with the current entry. In this case, I am doing this in a range for loop right here. This is my search. This right here is a search. I have a range for loop that is basically going through every single element in L, going which is the name of the vector, and I'm extracting that element and then I'm comparing it to my guess that I'm going to show you that which is what I'm looking for to see if it's there or not. And if it is, I set a little flag to true, which is like a victory flag. Now, this code can be made much more efficient. In fact, let's go ahead and try that and do that. Because here's the thing. Right now, this code is going to search through every single element in the list. However, if it finds before it gets to the end of the list, the number, and it sets the, the uh, Boolean found to true, guess what? It's still going to keep searching through the rest of the list, which at this point is pointless because we've already found it. And so this is not exactly the most efficient piece of code I've ever written. So let's go ahead and improve that. How can we improve that? Well, here's the thing. Once you find what you're looking for, you don't need to keep searching. At that point, you can say like, hey, I found it. It's good to go. Just stop looking, you know. If, uh, if you have a deck of cards and you're looking for a specific card, once you find it, that's the end of that. You're like, yeah, I found it. You're not going to just keep searching, assuming you're going to find it again. I mean, you're literally holding it in your hand here, right? So the same thing can be said here. So this is going to be a scenario where because of the way the range for loop works, there's no easy way to break out of it unless we actually use the break statement. So this is going to be one of those scenarios where I guess break will be okay to use. So how can we do that? Well, first of all, we need to make our curly brackets to the if statement because we're going to add two commands. First, we're going to set found to true, and then we're going to call break. And now, having done this, if you run it again, it's going to be the exact same as before, but it is technically more efficient. How can I prove that to you? Well, I can add a little counter. Start that at zero. And then every time we go in the loop, that's one comparison because we're doing the if guess equals equals i. In fact, we can even do it as an else here. Count plus plus. What does this mean? Oh, come on. There we go. What this means is we're going to check if the numbers are equal. And if they are, then uh, we're done. We're not counting that extra count. So I guess we'll, we'll start this at one because we assume that one count is good. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Keep it at zero. Yeah. If we don't find it, then we add it to the count. Okay, so technically we want to add it to both counts, so I could put it above, but we'll leave it like that. We'll say all of the misses that we have. So if we go ahead and do it like this, and we count error, not count, that's right. And we add this here, there we go. Okay, let's enter a guess again, let's do eight. We found it, that's good. Oh shoot, but we didn't actually print out the counter. We we got we gotta print out the counter so we can see uh, how much it counted. Found it again. Cool. It did eight counts. Oh, interesting. Eight number is eight. Really? 
Well, technically, it's, it's off by one because it does, we're not counting for the actual guess as the match. But there's eight misses, per se. So technically, it's a ninth number. So that's, yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's eight, okay? We run it again. This time, let's put, it, put it eight again. This time, we didn't find it, so we have ten misses. Okay, that's, a, that's expected. So this is known as the worst-case scenario. The worst-case scenario in an algorithm is where, at least in a, in a searching algorithm, is where you don't find what you're looking for. And why is that the worst case? Because when you don't find what you're looking for, you have to search through everything. And only when you've searched through everything can you confidently say, look, I looked at the thing and, and, the, and the card is not there. We lost we lost the eight of A's, eight of hearts or something. That's the worst case scenario because that's the most work involved. Can you guess the best case scenario? The best case scenario is going to be when you find what you're looking for as the first card. It's like your lucky day. You, you start looking at the cards and the first one that you take out of the deck to check is literally the card you're looking for. That's the best case scenario. That's the ideal because bam, you're done. You're like, oh, cool. I guess I got it. Moving on to with life, right? So those are best and worst case scenarios. And those are important things to analyze in an algorithm because at the end of the day, when you're trying to sell your algorithm to somebody, you know, you can tell them, yeah, on average, my algorithm does really good. And they're like, that's cool. But we need to know what the worst case scenario is because we need to know what to, you know, prepare for the worst, plan for the worst, as they say. And so it's important to understand what the worst case scenario is so that you can you can tell that to other people. So, yes, yeah, the structures. So um, you definitely want to want to know that the best case scenario is not that useful, per se. It's nice to know because it's a selling point, I suppose. But, you know, it's it's all about luck with the best case scenario, really. Like, how often are we going to make that the best guess? Have we even, you know, we, let's try to, let's try this again. So we found the worst case scenario, but, you know, what are the odds here that we're going to get the best case scenario? Oh. I should really make it a command line argument because I keep wanting to do that. Yeah, so, I mean... We have to get really lucky here to actually guess a number and that number to be the first number. That's even harder uh, uh, math problem to solve. <laughs> but uh, that, what are the odds of that? But yeah, here we got a little bit lucky. I mean, this one we found it as a as the uh, fourth spot because these are the three misses and then we and then we found it. So this this one's kind of getting close to the uh, best case scenario, but you know, not quite there yet. And so. That's kind of the story behind time complexity and this, in general, big O and all that stuff, which again, you will learn in detail in 302. But what we, what I really was trying to show you with this is that as you can see, the number of misses is related to how, where we find it. Whereas if I took away the brick that we had as we had it originally, you're gonna see that every single time Regardless of, of wh wh whether the number is found or not, which in this case, we haven't found anything yet. Wow, okay. There we go. We found it one time. You can see there it's 9, and then we look again. And it's always going to be either 10 or 9. See? In this case, it found it, but it still did 9 searches. Why? Because we're not stopping. Once we find the number, we're still searching. So we are going to have those 9 misses always. Or 10 if the number isn't even there yet so you can see that breaking out early is a good idea because you want to stop searching once you found it okay so ultimately you were this is I guess your first experience with the difference between just any code and efficient code and imagine that it's a really big list the moment you find it you there is no reason to keep searching for for more stuff so okay let me rewrite this because suppose that that was a question at the end of the last class somebody asked can we print out the index of where it's found? So can we do that? And then I said, well, yes, yes, we can, but kind of we have to switch things around because this range for loop doesn't really have the index. Now we could create a, another counter. We have a counter here. We could probably get away with using this counter uh, to print out the index actually. Yeah, we might actually get away with doing that. Uh, although I think a better way would be using the other kind of for loop. Because that just the i in the for loop there would be what we want. But actually, this this counter actually will work for that. Let's just see if it's. I, I don't think it should be off by one. 
In fact, yeah, yeah, we don't need to, yeah, we don't need to do anything. We can just say found it and then found it at, I think this, this will just work basically because we were printing basically the index. <laughs> I didn't even think about that until that happened. So we'll see. I think it should be good. Might be off by one. Assuming that I can actually guess a number. Oh, my God. There we go. Okay. Found it at seven. So is our indexing right here? So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. There we go. So we solved that problem actually by a kind of accident. So yes, we, you, there you go. Using a counter, we can figure out where the index is. And then, of course, when you get index 10, that means that it wasn't found because there's not even an index 10 here. It goes from zero to nine, right? So yes. Anyways, the other way that I wanted to show you I still show you anyways, is um, the old school for a loop. And so we have a vector, so we can remember with vectors, you can access yourself the same way as the array. So you can say if guess equals equals, but you're not gonna do I now. Instead, you're gonna do the name of the vector, which is, I believe is L. Yep, vector L, and then your square brackets, and then the I in there, because that's the index. And if you find it, then you know what the index is, so you can say CL found that index, and then I. So that takes care of, of that finding part. However, suppose that you wanted to keep the index after the loop, because remember scope rules, that I only lives here. If I try to see out the eye here, it's going to give me an error saying that it's not in the uh, scope. I was not declaring the scope, right? So what can I do if I want to actually print out the eye outside? Easy. Just declare the eye outside. You don't even need to initialize it there. You can do that inside the loop. And then here, the initialization doesn't have to be a declaration. You can actually just put anything you want in there, any code you want. So you can say I equals zero. So now we're going to initialize this I inside this loop and use it. And so now we solve that problem as well. Although here, this code will not run. Oh, it will run because the for loop is there. Yep, yep, okay. So if you try five here, 10, better luck next time again. Run five again, found it. So you can see here, this, this part of the code is from the new for loop that we added. It says found that index one. And then, uh, where is the 10 coming from? Oh, I see. It's a one there. But what about this? Oh, no, no, no. Ah, yeah, that's, we have an error here, actually. The, the searching worked fine in our for loop, but the C out I beneath us gave us 10. That's because we forgot to stop the loop after, the, uh, after we find something. We did not stop it, so it actually kept going until the end. So that's, again, the inefficient version of this. So how do I make it efficient? Out of my break. However, however, I don't like break. So we have our Boolean found. We can set that to true. Found gets true. And then I guess I'll set it back to false here so that this thing works too. Found gets false again here. But instead of here doing this i is less than 10, we can say i is less than 10 and found has not been found. So not found. Okay? That way we don't have to use our evil break statement that I've been telling you not to use and then I go ahead and use it, right? So <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, what is it, the, what is it saying? I gotta do what I preach? Is that what they say? I don't know. It's basically, do, do you know, if, if you say not to do something and then you do it, you're, you're a hypocrite, right? So I wanna make sure I'm, I'm not a hypocrite. So yeah, ultimately, how do I achieve that? I achieve that by putting it inside of the logical expression. Practice what you preach. Yes, there we go. That's the one. That's the one. Yes. So I want to practice what I preach, right? Not to use break statements. And so here you go. This is me not using a break statement because the better way to do this instead of putting a break statement in here is to modify my for loop's logical expression, which is what is checked before you enter the for loop. And so now we still have our i is less than 10, but we have this extra check. And that extra check is whether we found what we're looking for. And if we found it, then we don't need to go any further. And so that's why I have the little exclamation mark there, because remember, that stands for the logical not. So we're saying, 
if i is less than 10 which means we still gotta search more and we have not found it and not found so what's going to happen when found is true then we're going to say not true which is false and false in an and statement always evaluates to false right because whatever true or false and something false will evaluate to false obviously false and false will evaluate to false but if it's true and false that will also evaluate to false the only time an and statement evaluates to true is if you have true on both sides of the and logical expression so that solves that problem and so now we don't have a break statement which is of course better much cleaner code much easier to understand you can see that even me speaking the code out loud is sort of self-explanatory i is less than 10 and not found right that that sounds pretty self-explanatory to me so anyways linear search that is basically all there's to it any questions on linear search Again, it's, it's nothing more than just looping through the entire thing using either a range loop, a for loop. You could even use a while loop, actually. That, that, that actually would be okay. Uh, it'd be very close to this version, too. You just kind of actually be kind of a mix of both. But with the while loop, you can still put the uh, this could be your, your logical expression as long as your i is declared outside, kind of how it is here, actually. And you want to initialize it outside. Here, I guess. So. I guess I'll code it real fast, why not? Good review, right? So, um, int i is equal to, well, we have an i, so let's just do a j now. j equals to zero, while j less than 10 and not found. And then you can basically copy and paste the if statement inside of here. Just make sure you don't forget to change this to a j. And then, just make sure you add J++ at the bottom. Done. That should work, unless I made a typo somewhere. Um, yet again, go ahead and throw in a uh, found gets false. Otherwise, it'll break the code beneath it. So, file again. Come on. Wow. Okay, I might have broken it. Or I'm just that unlucky. Okay, I was like, whoa, that's that's a streak of bad luck right there, okay? I better not go outside today. I might get, like, virus or something. Um, I haven't gone outside in so long, though, so that's okay. Yeah, wow, I had, like, wow, that's a, that's, that's a lot of misses. Wow. Okay. Interesting, man. But, yeah, okay. So, in fact, I actually thought the code was broken until I was like, no, no, it's got to work. And then it did. Okay. So, we guessed 5 and finally found that index 2. Is it really at index 2? Yes. 0, 1, and 2. Yay. What is this tree, though? This tree looks randomly there. What does that mean? C out I. I guess that's what this I is coming from. The 3 here. Mmm, I see, I see, I see. Yes, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this three and why it's a three and not a two. So in this version with the for loop, we had a three there instead of a two where the index is. Why is that the case? Because remember, when you get to the end of the if statement, you run the increment part and then you check this. So this is off by one because of that. So, you know, fixed like that. But hey, those are the kind of logical sem sem semantic errors that you, that you might actually uh, face if you're not careful like I was. I, I, like I wasn't careful. I mean. So here we go. Now it's fixed. Oh, wow. Oh, I thought we were we got the first one here. But no, we were not that lucky. We were almost there. We were one off. But yeah. So found that index one. Found that index one. So this is the while loop. This is the, the for loop that has the, the old school for loop. This is the I outside the old school for loop. And then this is the new, the range for loop. And then of course, here's a list so we can see it. And there's our five and there's outside of the range for loop. So now you got all three loops in one program. And yet another example as all, how all three loops are, well, the while loop and the for loop are interchangeable. The range for loop, not quite because that one is strictly based on using it for vectors and that kind of list data structure. You can't just 
throw anything at it because you can't just make it an infinite loop. The whole point of that range for loop is to make the code safer in that sense. But a range for loop can be converted into any kind of while or, or, or for or other kind of for loop though. That you can go in that direction. Okay. So uh, I don't see any questions. So we shall move on to sorting them. Let me uh, open that up then. So let me first define sorting. You can see it right there. Here, let me, in fact, let me move this here. There we go. And maybe this as well. I have my definition of sorting in here, so I'm going to put it right there. Okay. So let me go ahead and define sorting, or at least this is the definition that they give. I, I believe they give this one in the book, so yeah. That's funny. I have not opened the book in quite a while. By the way, I don't. Uh, if you if you kept up with this quarter, we are switching to a new book from this from the next semester and on. Uh, so you may run into a situation where if you take 202 uh, in the fall, or is there anybody that's taking it in summer three with me? I don't know. That's hardcore. But uh, if you are taking it at any point, you are, we are switching to a different book now. It's a free book. So the whole point of that is to help you guys out, especially during these hard times. So if you haven't gotten the book for this semester, then don't get it at this point because the free book legally free book is uh is the one we're going to be using from now on i'm in charge of coordinating 202 and i have made that decision so yes that is what's going to happen so sucks if you guys bought the book because that's also going to be the case for 135 as well so it sucks if you guys bought the book this semester but Hey, it's a really good book too. Like, frankly, that's one of the best books you might have as a reference, um, just to keep it somewhere. You know, if you ever forgot how to code something. Although, Google is also faster and better. But books are books. You know, they they look nice on libraries, bookshelves and stuff. So, anyways, sorting, rearranging a collection of values into a logical order. So, a sorting order. I suppose. What kind of logical orders do we have? Well, there's two main ones that we have. Ascending and descending. Think of the alphabet. How do you sort the alphabet? In ascending order, you go from A to Z, right? If you think of A, but, but, but for that to work, you have to define what ascending means, right? Because I could be like, well, A is a big, A is bigger than B. So technically that's a descending order then. So which one's right? They're both right. You just, when you're sorting something, you have to decide how two things compare to each other. And that's why in the sorting definition, you see the part that says logical order. When you say one is, is smaller than two, that's because we've kind of decided that in math. And that works with math. And with letters, I'd say it's, it's almost well-defined that A comes before B. However, if you're sorting colors, how do you sort them? You need to have a way of comparing them and saying this color is bigger than this color, right? Or this color comes before this color. So part of, part of the art of sorting is also figuring out how two things compare to each other and how we define something to be larger, smaller, or equal to something else. If you're sorting a, uh, a bunch of ships, I think that was an assignment at some point, last time I did 135, um, then you may sort them based on something that's numerical about them, such as their weight. And then you can sort in an ascending order, such as going up in weight, or descending order, such as going down in weight. But you could also sort it based on something else completely. So you have to have your, your system of so that you can compare 
two things and how they if one is bigger or smaller than the other one okay and within that the two major ways are ascending and descending ascending of course is basically small to large typically this is what we use when we're sorting pretty much everything however you know descending order could be useful such as uh imagine you're in the titanic and it's sinking and they're like women and children first right all right let's ignore the one part let's just say children then you could say that you could sort people in descending age so the younger people get to escape first and then the older people are the last ones to get out right so that could be i guess a descending order example um what all what else well mm, i don't know i'm sure I, I will i'm you can think of a thousand things, but then when you really want to think about it, telling somebody, you forget them. So that's the only one that came to my head. But uh, what else could you do in descending order that would make some sense? I mean, I guess if you're if you're doing a countdown and you're trying and you sort of store the numbers before you say them out loud, I guess you're going in descending order. So there you go. By the way, there's a rocket launching today at twelve fifty-five. Um, yeah, so really, most of the time you see things in descending order, but a few times you might see things in descending order. That is, of course, okay. Most of these algorithms, the way you switch them from ascending order to descending order when you're sorting is a matter of switching a, a symbol from less than to greater than, and that's it. Like, literally one character change will switch your algorithm. There is something that I would like to point out about the terminology here. Sometimes people prefer to, instead of using ascending and descending, they prefer to use the following two. Let me spell these correctly first. How do you spell descending? Okay. D this is like lawyered up term of, of ascending and descending basically so if you want to be uh very technical if i say sort this in ascending order and i give you a bunch of lists and the list has a duplicate in it you can come back to me and say i have no idea how to sort these two numbers in my list because they're equal which one goes first and then you can be like, it doesn't matter, they're equal, man. They're like, no, 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 you gotta tell me exactly how to do this, otherwise I'm not doing anything. So, kind of like lawyer tier. And so, you're like, okay, fine. Then, uh, you know, whichever one you find first, just let it be or something, or whatever. Well, to avoid this sort of lawyer world, we have the, the following relatively weird sounding term, but still simple once I tell it to you non-descending order non-descending order is technically ascending order because that means sort the items in a way that they're not descending and so you could say that if you put a number the next number so it's not descending can be either bigger or technically also equal because that would also be non-descending right if they're all equal if you have a list with 10 numbers and all of them are the same then bam, you have a non-descending order list, right? Other way around. If you want to do a descending order list, but you have duplicates, then technically you want a non-ascending order list. Now you can, of course, have one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven. So you have a duplicate of six. And a non-descending order list means that the one will follow the two because you can't put it by a three or by a one back again. Well, technically you could. If you go one, two, and then you try to go back to one, you can't because that is a descending order, right? So you can only go to the same number, so one, two, 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 or one, two, three. You cannot go one, two, one, because that would violate non-descending. So really, when you say non-descending order list, that allows you to, to sort of cover yourself if there's duplicates, because that means if there's duplicates, that's fine that they can go one after the other. There's no problem. If it's increasing, that's okay, as long as it's not descending, okay? So ultimately, these two terms are equal. But I suppose that the second one is better, clearer, per se. And you can avoid a lawsuit, I guess, or something. 
So non-descending order is basically what you what we think of as ascending order, but covers ourselves in the case of duplicates. Okay? So yes. An example of that, I'll put it right here, will be like one, two, three, three, four, five. And this will be like five, four, four, three, two, two, one. Like that. Whereas this will be one, two, three, four, four, three, one. They don't have to list all numbers. They can skip numbers as long as it's in the, sim, in this, in the descending order. So, yeah. If you hear these terms, don't freak out. Don't be like, why are they using like a negative or something? It's to, it's kind of just a... Like, again, I guess the best way to say it is just lawyered up version of that. You know, to cover yourself. So, uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's basically sorting. So, let's talk about bubble sort. So there's a lot of sorting algorithms. There's bubble sort, selection sort, insertion sort, merge sort, quick sort, keep sort, bogo sort, uh, tim sort, which is a combination of quick sort, of uh, merge sort and selection sort, I believe. There is also uh, radix sort, count sort. It's like the Forrest Gump thing with the uh, shrimp, you know. Basically the same thing for sort. You can you can. Think of anything and there's a sort attached to it and now you created a sorting algorithm, right? So there's a lot of them, which is why it's a 302 thing because there's a lot to cover. We, I would not be able to cover them all today or tomorrow. I mean, maybe if I spend a full week next week doing it, I could, but it's not point because that's not really what the class is about. And you really need to be good at programming before you can even complicate code any complicated sorting algorithms. Otherwise, you're just stuck. So the easiest one that we can talk about is bubble sort. And uh, it's not fast, it's slow. In fact, the time complexity is O n squared, which means that when I was talking about n squared, so like if there's 10 numbers, it's gonna require about 100 comparisons to do. And if each comparison takes a second, then 10 numbers will take 100 seconds to do. Yeah, but what about 20 numbers? That's gonna take 20 squared, so that's 400 seconds to do. So you can see this is going up like that, like a parabola. Because it's squared, if you try to graph the graph of, a, of, a, of a, a squared function, it goes like that, right? You don't care about the negative because you know, you're know you not sorting negative numbers. Well, you could, but I'm saying you're not sorting negative amount of numbers. So you really only care about the positive side. But you can see that grows really fast. So, you know, the more numbers you have, the way, way slower this gets until it takes infinity time, basically, for all sense and purposes. Like, you will die before the thing finishes sorting. So, not infinity time. That's kind of overkill. There are slower, low, slower algorithms. But, uh, yeah. So, this isn't exactly, by any means, don't get excited and try to show this to someone to be like, wow, this is amazing. I can sort numbers in bubbles or time. No, no, no. It's bad. It's slow. But it's easy. And it kind of helps you understand how sorting works. So, how does bubble sort work? Let's go ahead and throw in a couple of numbers at random. So here, let's use our RNG number generator and use those numbers. How about that? That's that's a cool usage of, uh, whoa, that's weird. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Uh, there we go. All right, let's just run this again with just any number. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure, why not? We I was thinking of single digit numbers, but why not? All right, so let me just write these numbers down and then I'll switch over to the tablet. 15, 9, 9, 13, 8, 0, 1, 3, 1, 8, 0, and 8. Okay? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Cool. Do we have duplicates in there? Yeah, we do. That's that's good that we have duplicates. Okay. How convenient. We have a little RNG number generator, lit, you know, for sorting. Yeah. That'll come in useful, right? Okay. So here we got our numbers. I'm going to make them look pretty by putting a red bubble in them. Like that. Okay. So we got a list of numbers. We got to sort them. And why do we got to sort them? Because 
A, we like to look things that are, are sorted and they look pretty. But more importantly, as you can guess, as I was talking about earlier with the library example and all that, once we sort them, we can actually look for a number if it's in the list in a faster time than linear time. We're going to use it. We're going to actually be able to find it in logarithmic time, which is which is faster. So potentially this list, we can search a number in half the time than the number of items. So whereas with linear search, 10 items will take us 10 seconds because it takes us one second per number to look at. Just that's a guess. Now we can do it in five seconds, which is half the time. Pretty fast, you know. Maybe for one that's not, in, you know, not noticeable, but if you're doing it for a, a thousand of these, that's quite fast. So, yeah. All right. Well, then, how do we do this? Okay. The idea of bubble sort is to bubble numbers up. And uh, the way you do that is you compare two items in the list. And you sort of have this sliding effect. So let's let's take this slowly. I'm going to put some arrows to kind of represent what I'm looking at. And I'm always going to be looking at two numbers at once. However, the numbers that I'm looking at will change depending on where I'm at in the algorithm. So what I want to do is I want to look at the first two numbers. Okay? And we're going to be sorting for now in our non descending order aka ascending the reason I say non descending is because I have duplicates so technically ascending is quote unquote incorrect according to lawyers and all that whatnot so okay I look at these two things now if you remember um, at some point someday in class I was talking about a swap function in the magic trick, yes, in the magic trick. I show you guys the swap function, right? They can swap two things. And I said that that will come in very useful. It will, because th that will be very, very important. So, well, I will show you how to do that. When we code it, it will be basically what I show you then as well. So, we look at these two numbers. We got uh, the left and the right. We will consider them left and right. So, we'll say this is the left number and the right number. And so, because we are sorting in non-descending order, we're going to look at them and... If the number on the right is bigger than the number on the left, we do nothing. Is that the case here? Yes, it is. 19 is bigger than 15. And I guess I'll keep track of what I'm doing. So, if 15, or actually 19, is bigger than 15, do nothing. However, instead of putting 19 and 15, let me call them left and right. So if the right is bigger than the left, do nothing. Better yet, if it's bigger than or equal to the left, do nothing. However, otherwise, The right is less than the left, right? We'll do something in that case, but let's get to that situation, okay? So if we do nothing, what do we do after? Well, technically we don't, we do stuff. <laughs> I guess we don't do nothing. We basically move on, okay? What do I mean by moving on? It means that I'm going to look at the next, two, next number technically. So I'm gonna shift things to look at the next number, which is a nine. So, the right is going to go from looking at 19 to looking at 9. The left is going to go from looking at 15 to looking at what the right was looking at, which is 19. So all I'm going to do is basically shift it one spot, okay? All right, so now I'm looking at the 19 and 9. And I'm going to do my check again. Is the right bigger or equal to the left? Do nothing, right? But in this case, the right is not. The right is not bigger than the left because 19 is actually smaller than 9. Sorry, 9, <laughs> nine is smaller than 19, okay? And because of that, th we have violated this little rule. So we got to go into the otherwise case. So what is the other guy's case? The otherwise case is that the right is actually smaller than the left, which is the case here because 9 is smaller 
the 19. Okay, so what do we do in that case? You swap. And then you move on. So what do I mean by swapping them? Exactly that. Switch the locations in there in the list of those. So let's go ahead and perform that operation. Bam, done. Okay, however, I don't want to mess up my left and right, so we're just going to actually swap the numbers themselves. That's better. Okay? So, how do you actually swap? Again, this is how we did the magic square. So, swap them, you technically need... Let's, let's watch a replay of the swap between these two numbers. This is what we start with, right? But here's the thing. I'm trying to put this here, right? Can I do this? No, because if I do this, I have lost the 9. Or the 19, I suppose. That is gone forever. This will overwrite that, literally squish this out of existence with that. So I'm screwed, okay? The same thing as the magic square. All right, let's try the other way around. Maybe we put this on top of that. Yeah, but now we really, we destroyed the nine. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need a temporary variable. Called temp, which, you know, has whatever, garbage. That's okay, because what are we going to do? We're going to take either one of these. So let's just go with the 19. We're going to store it in temp which allows us then to basically to do it here. And what's really happening, so let me do it like how the computer will do it. What the computer we wanna do is we wanna copy this. So basically we have 19, we copy it here. Then we're gonna copy the nine and overwrite the 19 with the nine. Cool, that's step two. So step one was create a temporary variable and put the left in there. Step two is overwrite the left with the right. Step three is going to be to take the 19 that we backed up in temp and put it on the right, which would overwrite that. Technically, again, it's technically a copy of it. So we have that, and now we put it here, which is basically saying R gets temp. Look at that. I'm so good at drawing squares, right? <laughs> so yeah, that is your swap function. And swap, I guess, I said it back then, but now you get to see it. It's a very important thing in computer science sorting because it's all these sorting algorithms are comparison-based algorithms, sort comparison-based sorting algorithms, which involve swapping things at the end of the day. There are other kind of sorting algorithms out there, but these ones involve swapping. So, yes. Oh, stay. Okay, cool. That's a lot of explanations for just a tiny little swap but i want to make sure that we all get this so okay move on we swapped so we can move on so now we can move our little arrows to the next number as you can see they're shifting by one every single time let's look at 19 and 13 all right which one's bigger 19 is bigger right so if 13 is greater than or equal to 19 do nothing but in this case it's not it is less so then we go with the second line otherwise swap them so we got to swap them because 13 is smaller than 19 so let's go ahead and perform our swap again we will have to use a temporary variable to do the swap just like i showed you before okay but i'm not going to do it again because i will show you there's no point in, you know you i think you got this if you didn't let me know but yeah okay um 
All right, now we can move on to the next case. 19 and 8. Which one is bigger? 19. So, yet again, we got a swap on our hands that we have to do. So, let us perform our swap. Great. Moving on. 19 and 0. We got to swap them. Every single one of these comparisons is taking time in the computer. How many do we have to do potentially? This is an n squared algorithm. We might have to do this a hundred times before we finish sorting. So it's gonna take quite a bit of time. So I'm gonna to have to potentially skip ahead a little bit here. But the 13 will swap with the 19 and it actually turns out that it'll keep swapping because 19 is the biggest number of the whole list. Oh, we got two zeros as well. Cool. Okay, we finally get to the last two. Uh, bam, our list got a little bit wiggly. There we go, squiggly, I don't know what the term is. Um, okay, we finally finished what we call an iteration of our sorting algorithm. Iteration because we basically did one whole pass of the, of the algorithm. And every time that you run one pass of bubble sort, you are guaranteed that you have sorted one of the numbers, the last number of the list. As you can see, that is the case here. While these numbers are potentially in the right place or the wrong place, we don't know, we don't care technically. What we do know is that this single number here is in the right spot of the final list. So every time you run one pass of bubble sort, you will have sorted one number by basically saying you put it in the right spot and it will be the biggest number or the smallest number if you're sorting in a non-ascending order, which is a descending order. Okay, but this is ascending, so that. And maybe you can guess as to why this algorithm is called bubble sort, because it bubbles the numbers, in this case, the biggest number to the end of the list. And the next pass that we run is going to bubble the second biggest number and put it as a second item in the list from the from from the end to the beginning, right? So, as you can see, 15 is the biggest number of the remaining list. This next pass of bubble sort that we're about to run should put that 15 where that last eight is. To get there, though, it's going to have to be bubbled up. So it's going to have to you're going to have to do a single swap for each of these. That's going to be the worst case scenario of this bubble sort algorithm. It's gonna to have to do that many swaps just to get it all the way or to bubble it all the way up to the end of the list. It's actually the, the worst, worst case scenario really here. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and perform that. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this beneath the, uh, the square here. So first, let's go ahead and take our left and right and reset them. Oh, oh, almost lost track of them there. Let's get rid of these lines here. Okay. And uh, we can keep a little marker here that we sorted out already because I want, I want to make a point of that later on. Let's go ahead and do this pass again. How many swaps did we do here? I don't even know. Um. I think the 19 was at the beginning of the list, wasn't it? Let me see. Oh, I was the second item in the list. It was 15, 19, 9. So I guess I'll uh, I'll leave that in my notes that that was the original list. Copy pasta. I'll just throw it in here like that. And then maybe there. Okay, so that was the OG list. Okay, so we go and do the same thing again. We say, which one's bigger? 15 is bigger, so that one's gonna be the one that's gonna go on the right side. Next two, 15 is bigger than 13, so that's gonna go on the right side. As you can see, here we have the 15 bubbling up 
because it's the biggest one of the entire list. We don't know that. The computer doesn't know that. I mean, we do because it's a small list, but this is happening in the computer and the computer doesn't know that, so it can't really cheat and uh, skip to the end. We wish it could, but it doesn't. Oh. Oh, ha ha ha. Okay, never mind. Never mind there for a second. I didn't see an 18 in there. Oh, okay. That's cool. We just found an 18. I actually thought that 15 was the biggest number, but I guess there wasn't 18 all this time I missed. And actually, right there, there's no swap being made. I'm glad I caught that, actually. I was kind of an autopilot at that point. Cool, so no swap happens there. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, moving on. 18 and 8 and 0. That does swap. And then we got an 18 and the 8. So as you can see, what I told you was right, even if it necessarily wasn't the right number. I actually didn't notice that there was an 18 in there. But it's okay. As you can see, the 15 did get bubbled up better. So it, it actually, this was not the worst, worst case scenario. Because as you can see, the list is sort of sorting itself. Uh, not in the most efficient manner, because there's a lot of bubbling going on. But as you can see, the 15 is almost in the right spot as well. And the 18 is in the right spot now. So uh, we're making progress faster than I actually expected. Here's the thing, though. The way we... Then the most basic sense of the algorithm, when we finish this, we technically still compare this. We say 18 and 19, which of course does not swap, right? Because now, as I told you, every time this bubble sort running algorithm passes, you know, we sort one item in the list. When we actually go in and code this, we can actually add this check to the sorting algorithm to make it more efficient because there's no need to check the sorted part of the, the algorithm because at this point, you know, this is what I would consider the unsorted section, and this is the sorted section. We don't need to check the sorted section. That's a waste of comparisons, which again is slow. The more compare, every comparison takes time, physical time. We don't want that time, we want this to be fast. I mean, this is bubble sort, but within bubble sort, we can even make it faster. And so if we don't know anything, if we, all we know is bubble sort, then at least we can gain a little bit of extra time by doing that check. So. We'll do that same check once we actually code the algorithm, all right? But anyways, let me go ahead and copy and paste it again. That way we have a sort of the uh, resulting iteration after each one. And maybe we can put them all on top of each other at the end. Okay, let's bring a little arrows down to the beginning again. As you can see, I made a mistake because I thought the 15 was the biggest, right? But just like the computer, I couldn't assume that to be the case. So I had to go by hand, you know, by hand and I actually noticed that 18 was bigger. So I, there you go. More proof that there is no shortcut to this. There's no way that I can just be like, oh yeah, 15 is big. Let me just skip the checks and put it at the end. Can't do that. Especially when the, base, when the list is so big that you can't even keep it on the same page together. Can't do that. Even with something so small, I missed a number. Imagine if the list with a billion numbers in it. You're going to miss numbers that so you can't skip ahead. So quantum computing, none of that is going to fix that fact, actually. You have to check all the numbers. So, okay, 9 and 13. 13 is bigger, so no swap happens. So we slide. Now we do find a swap. Slide. Ah, I like this one that's coming up. We got this, 13 and 13. But if we look at our if statement here, if they're, if if the right side is greater than or equal to, that's why we have the symbol here, the, uh, the the equal sign there, then we do nothing. So in this case, we actually do nothing. This is a little bit of an important concept that is more of a trio two thing, but I'll briefly mention it. Notice that the 13s, you know, they're duplicates. But here's the thing. When you're sorting something, you may want to keep duplicate items in the original order that they appeared in the unsorted version. And you might be asking yourself why they're the same. Why does it matter if this 13 goes before the other 13? And you're right in the sense that it doesn't matter if all you care about is the number itself. But 
if you remember what I was talking about earlier with the ship example, you got to decide what you got to sort, what you're sorting based on. And so if you got a bunch of ships that you want to sort, I said you could pick the weight. So what if two ships have the same weight? Would you want one ship to appear before the other one? Well, that introduces the problem with what to do with duplicates. Who do you pick first? One solution, the easiest solution, is you could actually sort based on two keys. So we call the key the the uh, sort of the uh, the component of what you're sorting that is actually deciding what the sort will do. So that would be the weight, for example. By having multiple keys, you can say that you can sort by both the weight and the number of passengers that it can carry. And so that way, if you find yourself having a duplicate on the weight, then you can sort based on which one has the smallest amount of passengers, and you can go with that one first. So you can do multiple keys to decide problems where you have duplicates. In the case that you actually care about which order the duplicate should go in. If you don't care, then that's okay. You can just do whatever sort you want and be good to go. But if you do care, the other scenario is you want them to appear in the same order that you fed them in. So if you're trying to sort this list and you have two ships that have a weight of 13, but this is ship A and this is ship B, you know, and you and, and you don't want you want to sort you want them to stay in that order. You want A to always appear B, before B because that is the way that I gave it to you. How do you guarantee that that happens? Bubble sort guarantees that that happens actually. Bubble sort will not shift them out of order, but other sorting algorithms might actually shift them out of order. So what do we call that? We call that stability in a sorting algorithm. A lot of the times when you go on Google and you look up a sorting algorithm, it tells you a couple of the features, such as the time complexity, space complexity, but also it tells you whether it's stable or not. That's what they're talking about. You know, a stable sorting algorithm will not change the order of duplicate keys. Whereas an unstable sorting algorithm, all bets are off. It could flip them. It could not. It basically says, I don't care about how duplicates get put as long as the order, as long as the order of the keys is good, it's a non-descending order, then it's okay. If me getting to that spot means flipping them around, it's kind of like saying, okay, I got my deck of cards here. I'm just gonna throw them all on the table and then I'm gonna sort them because that's the fastest way I can sort. Yes, things will get out of order before they can get in order again. Duplicate keys may get mixed up before they come back. If that's unstable. Stable is like, okay, I got these two duplicate keys. I got these two 13s, but the, the first 13 appear first. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep that first. And you will see that that actually is the case. Here, we can, do, we can label these as A and B as well. And you will see that they will never flip around. That you'll never see the B go before the A. So solutions, if you, if, you have a, if you have a sorting problem that requires stability, you can choose to do a stable sorting algorithm or you can still choose an unstable one, but then you have to use multiple keys to sort, such as I'm doing here. You could put you could put a label to the, each of the duplicates, and you can use that as a secondary key, and that will guarantee that as well. But uh, you know, it's a little bit of extra work. However, some algorithms like merge sort are stable, which are really fast. But quick sort is also really fast too. But that one's unstable. So if you really want to use quick sort, you can do this multi-key method. So a lot of this stuff is a uh, beyond the scope of the course, but I thought I'd tell you about stability because it's a useful thing to know. We have a lot of time, so why not throw that in? Okay, so anyways, um, let's go on and move, let's move on here. The 15 is bigger than the 13, so no swap happens. You get here, these do swap. 15 and eight, they do swap. And that's it, because this is technically the sorted side of the array. We don't need to check any further. And if we were to check any further, you would see that no swap and no swap. So, yes. <sighs> it's a little bit exhausting to do this. Okay. Let's, uh, let's kind of remove the messiness from that. We should really should have gone with a smaller list, to be honest. But, uh, okay, we're committed now. We're almost done, actually. So Okay, 9 and 8. 9 and 8 will... So this is another iteration of the algorithm. We have sorted one more item, so yay. 
Okay, nine and eight do swap. Swap. I won't say the word swap anymore. I'm just going to do it. That's okay. That's okay. That's not okay. Good. That's it. We're done. We don't have to check the other one, but if we did, you'd see that nothing would swap. As you can see, the list is indeed getting more sorted in a very uh, slow, but, you know, I guess slow, but surely. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, that eight threw me off for a second, but it's okay. All right, so let's swap these. That's okay. That's okay as well. That's not okay. That also needs to be swapped. And we're good to go. <sighs> Almost there, guys. Let me again reorganize the numbers since it's getting all weird. There we go. Okay, so this is not swap, does not swap, does swap. All right. One more swap and we are good to go right there. Okay, the rest is good. All right, almost there. We actually are about one more pass from sorting the entire thing. This pass is the good one. Not the last pass of the algorithm. We will need to do one more pass, but at least this one after this, I can tell you that it looks like it's gonna be sorted. Um, okay. Come on, it will not move. And then blah blah and we're good to go. Okay, so we are we still did swaps, so we are still gonna go one more time, even though it we know because we're humans, we see it and it looks sorted. We don't really know that if the list was very big that we couldn't fit it in our brains. So we will do one more pass. But here's what's gonna happen in this one more pass. This doesn't swap. This doesn't swap, this doesn't swap, and then taking care of the rest we've already organized. But if we check, we would see that nothing swaps. So that is a sign to stop. When nothing swaps in one pass, that is going to be our sign that we are done sorting because nothing swapped, which means the list is sorted. And as such is the case here, no swaps were made, so the list is sorted. We are finally done. You can see how the list started from this. It went to this. Still looks like a mess. This, this, as you, it starts to get better, 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 and finally sorted. That's bubble sort. So, uh, any questions before we actually coat bubble sort? I'll take a 30 second rest while you guys ask questions. I want to make sure you guys understand this because it's a uh, important. It's the first time you're really converting lot. I mean, battle royale too, but this is one of the first times that you're converting uh, something logical into actual code. Now you're thinking this looks so complicated. When I sort, I just kind of look at things and put them in the right spot. Again, you can't do that when because. This, this system will work for no matter how big the list is. Assuming you have infinite time and space, this system will work for any size of the list. Your system of a human of sorting, which is kind of like selection sort really works, 
does not work like that because you you don't have the mental capacity, I suppose, to store a billion numbers in your head to know where something goes, right? So it actually turns out that this is just as fast as a human could sort. So, yes. All right, no questions. So let us code bubble sort. Excuse me. All right. So we're done with the searching one, so we're going to close that for now. And I basically copied and pasted the RNG from the previous from the previous code into a new file. So this is basically just RNG is the list again. We can uh, move over to that here. Don't forget this, and we're using branch based for loops. Okay, it works fine. So here we go. As you can see, we get a random list of size 10 every single time. And so we'll use that to sort it. So how do we sort it? Well, how do we convert the code or the concept that we were thinking into code? Well, if you look up here, we had our comparison, right? We had this. We said that the right is greater than the left do nothing, otherwise swap them. So the first thing that we can do is let's go ahead and code a swap function. That's going to take two parameters. We're using integers, so we'll stick with integers. We'll call them left and right. Oh, maybe uppercase left and right since we have a L as the list. Uh, even though it doesn't confuse itself, I, I rather keep it different names to avoid confusion. So, uh, yes. Okay, how do we swap them? Well, we have basically the code over here that we showed you. So, we, we're really just going to do that. Create a temporary variable. And assign one of them to it. Doesn't matter which one, we'll go with the left. Then you want to overwrite the left with the right value. And now you want to get the right value with the original left, which has been overwritten on left variable, but still remains intact in our temporary variable. As such the case. Bam, done. Swap function is complete. I spent already more time talking about it in the magic square function. Let's go ahead and make it a function prototype so we can keep our code clean. All right, so um, you can test to make sure we don't have any syntax errors by checking if it still compiles. It does, so no syntax errors. Okay, so we took care of that step. So again, this is divide and conquer. We do step by step. The next process is we need to do the uh, the comparison, right? If right of written and left, we could do that very easily. That's not the problem. The problem is figuring out how we're going to do this whole shift by one situation. Oh, so let's try and do one iteration of this which is just to, to get that 19 in the right spot so what can we do well we got to check each number of the entire list right and we potentially have to slide all the way to the end so that's a loop let's just loop through the list once and call it a day yeah I suppose that it might be best in our scenario to use an I uh, for loop because we want to be able to mess around with the indices. So we'll go ahead and say for J is equal to zero or uh, yeah, we'll do J. We want to be a purist because I can use I later on. Do I or what could be a nice name to make you guys feel better? Um, index okay index is less than the size of the list which is in size index plus plus and then how do we move through each of these 
how do we look at left and right? Well, we could use index and index plus one. So that, we're going to run into an issue with that, but that's okay. We'll look at that issue later. Uh, we can say see out left, and that's going to be L, which is our vector, at index, which is zero. And then see out the right value, which will be L index plus one. And yes, there is a problem here. We'll look at it soon. Let's just see if this will look at left and right of the entire list, okay? So we have a list that starts with two and ends at three. We first look at 210. That's good. We're looking at these two. Then we're, ideally we want to look at 102. We do. We look at, uh, sorry, 108. We do look at 108. And then we look at 816. Good. Then we look at 162. Good, two eight. So this is working fine until we get to the end. We're looking at eleven seventeen here. Then we're looking at seventeen three. But then we're looking at three zero. There is no such number here. It ends at three. Where's that coming from? Well, it turns out we're going out of bounds because when we get to the index being basically nine and list is ten, so it's going in one more time. We're looking at index is nine and nine plus one, which is 10. But there is no index like that in our list. So like, ah, oh, we're looking outside of bounds, right? That's bad. So what can we do? Well, the naive solution would be, why don't we start our indexing at negative one? Well, we shift the problem to the other side of the spectrum to the point it did nothing. Did it, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, wait. It still should have printed. I mean, this is bad what we're doing, but it still should have printed, right? Index negative one is less than size. So it should, it should why is it, it, just, it just, it just gives up. It's like, nope, we're not doing anything. But the for loop should work. Negative one is less than size. And then it gets to zero. That's weird. Did I do something weird here? Why does it not like the negative one? Negative one is less than size. Negative one is definitely less than 10. So why did it not even go into the loop? That is puzzling. It's just like, nope, we're not doing negative indices. Why? Negative one is less than size. That is strange. I do not know why. It's just, it's just true. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is like an unsigned. No, that would be weird. Let's try something here. I don't think that's going to print, but I want to confirm. Interesting. So the, so uh, it's not entering the for loop. What if we do index? So negative one less than L dot size. So I want to see what this evaluates to. That will give me a better understanding as to why that doesn't work. Invalid operand. So the FTD vector type int long unsigned. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's an unsigned integer. That's why. Okay, so the reason why it doesn't work is because this is unsigned and, neg and negative one is signed. And so it does not like that at all. So that's why this is causing problems with a negative number. But what I can do is like, if I really wanted to do this code, which again is wrong in the first place, but that was not the reason why I thought it was wrong. Um, it's more simple than that. But for now, just so I can show you what I wanted to show you originally, we're going to create a variable called in size, called L size, or actually here, 
we can probably just get away by doing some casting here. Hmm. Does not like me casting it. Does not even let me cast it. There we go. Okay, so static cast to the rescue. All right, so um, <clears throat> we fixed the ending part per se, or did we actually? Um, no, we didn't actually, <laughs> that's funny. But we also introduced the problem that I wanted to talk about, which is trying to go, f which, which I do see people sometimes do. And that is they try to print before the array, which yet again is the same problem, see? Here we get a zero, but technically it's out of bounds. So either way, both of these are bad. So the whole point of me doing that was to show you that you can also go out of bounds or behind it, and the thing doesn't crash. It might, but it doesn't crash sometimes. And so it's even worse when it doesn't crash, because now you're sorting a zero in, into the mix, which is really bad. So let's go ahead and remove all these nasty stuff that I did, and now I finally show you the right way to do it. You still start your indexing as zero, you still say index is less than size, but you change this here to say less than size minus one. And so now it's okay. So that was the solution. That was the good solution. You still start with 10, 10 in here. I guess this will look better if I put an end line here. Okay, I can just put it here. Oh, wait, no, 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 here. There we go. It looks nicer this way. So you can see the comparisons. So we do 0, 5, which is correct. Then we do 5, 6, 6, 15, 15, 7, and so on, until we get to the last one, which is 0, 6, and then 6, 6. 0, 6, and then 6, 6. So there you go. That is exactly what we want. In fact, I guess it'll look nicer if we uh, put them on the same line just with some spaces and then we, we don't actually need this here there we go looks looks cleaner if you want them to be lined up you could use a eo manipulator for that io man io man ip as i call it so there you go this looks much nicer so here we got the last one uh the one before that and so on so we have figured out how to compare how to how to how to slide how to have the sliding effect now we just got to add in the actual comparison right and what is the comparison this one if r is greater than l do nothing so really you know we could code it like that but you'll see that there's a better way so we could code it like we had it there so it's if r which is uppercase R or, uh, oh, well, we don't have him named yet. That's okay. But uh, we have him here. Uh, th this stands for left, and then this stands for right. Right? So we can say if right is greater than or equal to left, you do nothing, right? That's exactly what we have here. Otherwise, swap them, right? However, this is not good coding because I don't like to leave an empty if statement like that. If you're doing this, it means you got to swap your logic around. And you can do that very easily. Just do that. Now we don't even need an else clause. Like that. So really, what we care about is if the left is less than the right, right? Or sorry, if the right is less than the left, which is here, right? If this number, if if the number, if this, hold on, if this number is bigger than this number, that's what we care about because we want to swap them, right? So we're saying if the right number is smaller than the left number, then we've got to swap. We can also say if the left number is bigger than the right since swap them either one will work okay they're just the same thing saying it logic backwards 
And you can see the plus one means that this is the right one. So if this stuff is smaller, then you swap. Okay, so either one, I'll even put it as a comment. The other one that would work here would be to basically swap this around like this. So I could put this in the if statement and that would do the exact same thing. Because as you can see, they're the same. I'm just flipping them around, but I'm also flipping the sign. It's like saying A is equal to B is the same thing as saying B is equal to A in math, not in programming, right? Because equal is a different thing in, the, in programming, right? Equal is those two equal signs. But in math, you can do that. Okay? So uh, associate, I believe that's called the associative property, I think. But I'm not 100% sure. Ask math people. Or ask Google. Associative property. Eh, associative property is kind of the way factors are grouped into multiplication doesn't change. So not quite, kind of what I was saying, but not quite, but okay. Anyways, so, um, okay, so we got to swap them, right? How do we swap them? Well, we can call a swap function. And what do we pass? We pass the left and the right. It doesn't matter which order we pass them because you're swapping them, right? So really, you just got to pass them in, in whatever order you want. So I'm just going to pass them in whatever order it kind of appeared now. So there you go. Why does it matter? Because all you're doing is you're swapping them. If you pass them like this, you swap them like that. If you pass them like that, you swap them like that. So it doesn't matter. They're still going to get swapped. Cool. Let's run it and see. Uh, ah, I did the zoom out thing again. Hold on. It's a shortcut. It's control S, which is literally the same shortcut you use to save your code. <laughs> so I push it by accident when, and I have selected the OBS display instead of the uh, code. So, yes. Anyways, if you got, if that's too small for you guys to see, let me know. So control S to save. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and run the code. And nothing happens because we need to uh, print it out afterwards. So let's go ahead and print out the list afterwards. That line of code will do the printing for us, which is the same one that we do above. Okay, so this is before, this is how we start. This is our left and right, you know, as you can see, we get 14 and zero, and then you get 14 and 15, but you're like, what? There's 0 and 15. Well, yes, but that's because we did the swap. So if you want, I can add a little uh, C out statement here that says swap. I'm trying to make this nicer. So maybe if I remove this line feed here and I add this here, and I don't put a line feed here but I put it here. Actually, I could just put it here. That would look nice. Now we just need a line feed. So how many times would the sorting for loop have to run to sort the whole list in order? Size times, yes. So we will need to do this thing x number, the size number of times. So we will need an outer loop. Yes, that's what I was going to eventually get to. That's going to be the next step, actually. Anyways, we almost got this thing looking nice. I just need one more line feed here. Okay, last in line feed that we need here. Where's clear? Come on, damn it. Clear. Shocks. Clear. All right. So we got the original list, and then we can see the 19 and 11 get swapped, as they should. The 19 and 19 don't get swapped. That's good. 19 and 2 get swapped. 19 and 12 get swapped. Everything gets swapped. So it gets shifted all the way to the end. And as you can see, from this list to this list, now we got the 19 there. Cool. So we got to do this again, right? If we do it again, we'll swap the second number. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's just copy and paste this whole thing beneath it and run it again. 
Okay. We got a list here. 11 and 14 don't get swapped. 14 and 1 does get swapped. 14 and 18 doesn't get swapped. That's good. Because see, the, the, basically the 14 goes here, and then it looks at the 18 and doesn't get swapped. But then the 18 does get swapped all the way to the end. Then we run it all, all again for the second iteration. As you can see here, 11 and 1 get swapped. 11 and 14 doesn't get swapped. Eventually, you can see that 16 and 18 are good, but now we got 14 in the right spot. So here we had a little nice side effect. It actually sorted the, the last two digits because of how we had the 16, which was the second to last. That can happen. That's kind of cool. So now we have actually three things sort of sorted. Okay? So as you can see, every time we run this, we, we, we sort at least one number. So we got to run this potentially n times and standing for the size of the list. So instead of me copying and pasting code, which is not very good practice, all I got to do to wrap up the sorting algorithm here is just add this in the loop that runs the, the size of the list itself. So I'm going to just go ahead and write another for loop called uh, this time. Uh, it doesn't really matter what. So, I mean, I can actually, actually use a range for loop out here, but for no real reason whatsoever. Um, but why not? Let's do that. It might complain if I use autos, but we'll try it again. Um, L. That did not. Yay. So there you go. I just added a little loop that's going to run the size of the list. Now I got a little fancy and used a little range for loop. It worked, but if you want to use the uh, regular for loop to make more sense to you, you can doesn't really matter what you run it on. So I'm just using this X variable. Uh, and then of course you can do the L dot size here. And then X plus plus. And then that. So both of these lines will do the same thing essentially. As you can see that sorts the list. So interchangeable. You know, I, I kind of like using the range for loop because it's good practice. So I will stick to that one. But you can see that both do the same thing doesn't really matter what you do so let's look at actually how this happened we still got 12 minutes to look at this so that's good so as you can see that's a lot of stuff right that's that's what we would have done if we had you know kind of angry this does look like less swaps than the ones that i had to do when i did the rng you know <laughs> so i got unlucky i got a bad batch i guess of numbers so as you can see this has a bunch of 16 it's interesting and they're all over the place in the beginning kind of in the middle ish and then the end so uh, first, that first 16 is basically going to bubble up to this one spot, but then this, because it's stable, it's not going to be messed with, which is why these two 16s do not swap. So then this is the 16 that gets kind of bubbled up all the way until it gets these the 19, at which point it stays there, and the 19 is the one that gets bubbled up uh, until it gets here. So that's what we end up with. Um, but if there are duplicate numbers like the 4 or 5, 11s in the last one, would there be a way to break out of the loop early when it's all sorted? Yes. Well, yes, that exactly with the bull flag. So remember that I actually said that in the beginning. I said, how do you know that you're done sorting? Well, when you do one pass and no swap flags happen, so like here, here there's still one swap flag that happened. But here there's no more swap flags. So at this point, the list is actually sorted. And we still did like one, two, three, four, five five extra passes that we didn't have to do. So yes, the way you solve that is, whenever you do a swap, you can go ahead and set a, a flag here to still working to true. And then before your loop starts, you can go ahead and set that flag to false. Still working, set to false. And then put it inside of the uh, loop, like that. I guess so we don't mess around. Put it on this one, this line. Or actually, so it's, this looks prettier like that. Okay, and then this looks nicer like that. Okay, so now if this inner loop does a swap, then we will know that we're still working. So how can we change the code to uh, have that break out. 
Well, the get away, of course, is saying if not still working, then break. And that will do it. We can test it. As you can see, the la the la it it's uh here. I guess we should have put a print statement out. But as you can see, this last iteration, there's no swapping. So it it only it only ran one, two, three, four, and uh, it stopped. So otherwise, it should have run ten times as we saw here. So this is working. Um, however, I should have put this after the line feed so that it looks pretty. Should put this actually all the way at the end of this like that ah, there we go because it should print out like that there we go so as you can see it, it prints out one empty time and then it stops however practice what i preach right no break statements in there that's bad mojo so what do we do well if we want to do that we switch over which is why i left it here to the other for loop and then just go ahead and add an end statement here saying still working like that. However, you will have to change the declaration here. Whereas you will set this to false. You still set it to false here. You will have to move the declaration out here. So that you don't go out of scope here. Okay, like that. And so now you have added your flag outside. Damn it, I probably did spelling errors with the walking. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's the working. S still working. Okay, why did I not add a G? I don't know. Okay, there we go. Damn it, we broke it. Oh. We start out with true and still working. Okay, that should work better. Because we wanted to win, it's still working. Okay, okay. There we go. Okay. So I uh, flipped the flag upside backwards because I uh, sometimes what you do is you set something that sets swap to false when not when uh, and then you only set it true when something happens. Whereas we did some weird naming convention, but it's the same thing essentially. So yeah. So as you can see now, this time, once we do one pass where there is no swaps, then this flag never gets set to true. And because it doesn't get set to true, and every time that you run, it gets reset to false. Every iteration, it sets to false. That way, when you finish an iteration, if it's still set to false, it means you change nothing. However, if you change at least one tiny thing, one swap, then it gets set to true. And so it keeps going. But then again, it gets reset to false. If you don't reset it to false, this thing breaks and, and it actually doesn't work. It'll just do it 10 times. See, it's, it's just doing a lot of these, things. but that's okay. Um, you know, that just means that you're doing more work, but you're still sorting. It's just inefficiently. Like it's already inefficient. Now you're making it even more inefficient. So uh, just to make sure that we understand this again, see the bubble sorting here, the nine and the four get swapped. You can see that the 17 is in the right spot. Then the 13 is in the right spot. And, and it happens to be that all of these just happen to be in the right spot too. That's just because we got a nice list there. And then that brings up the six to the right spot. And then that brings up the five to the right spot. And actually the four and the two are now good, which is why after this it's, it's sorted. So no more swaps need to happen. So cool. And again, if we fix the flag thing, run it again, this time it will actually stop after that. So here we had, this was actually a really worst case scenario. Look at that. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine potentially iterations so we only really saved one here to do that that's probably that's oh, pretty much worst case scenario this one's not that bad we have one two three four 
five. This is like average per se, you know, you know, between best and worst, I'd say. Although really it's more like lower average because I would expect them to always be about six or seven. So yeah, that is bubble sort. That's how bubble sort works. It's just a combination of two for loops that are running from the size to the other size. There is one more um, improvement that we can do to this. And, so, and that is the one where I said that when you sort part of the list, you don't need to check it again. We're still checking it the way this is coded right now. How do we fix that? Easy. We do a little subtraction here where we subtract the X from the outer loop. Run it again. Still working. We didn't break it. Nope, not broken. However, I want you to notice something. Before, every single iteration, we are checking all 10 numbers. And as you can see, in the beginning of this one, for example, we swapped everything. Then this one, we still check it, but we don't swap. We still check these, but we don't swap them. That's why they're being printed. See, it keeps growing, the ones that we check, but we don't swap until eventually it goes all the way. So you can see the swaps are kind of bubbling upwards. All sort. Same thing on this example. However, after adding that little minus X there, I want you to notice how now we start out with 10. And now here, the last one is swap, but we're not checking 10 things anymore. We have two, four, six, eight. Here, we're checking two, four, six, seven. Here, we're checking two, four, six. Then we're checking two, four, five, then just four, and then just three, and we're done. Look at all those left and right that didn't get printed. They didn't get printed because they didn't get checked, but the sorting still worked because this time we did what I was saying, which is as we're sorting this, the section, the end of the list is sorted. So there's no point in doing the checks of like checking whether 18 is less than 19 because it's that part is already sorted because we guarantee that at the very least, every time that we run the uh, bubble sort iteration, it will sort one number at the end of the list or more, but at least one at the end. And so because we know it's at least one of them, we added that extra efficiency, which means there's a little bit less checks, which is a little better. How do we do that? We just subtract which number we're at on the list or how many, sorry, which iteration we're at on the list, which is basically the outer for loops value, the X. So we do L size minus one minus X. Bam. It's still a horribly slow algorithm, but at least it's a little bit faster and it's worth adding that. It, it starts to sort of introduce you to the concept of, can I improve the code? Can I improve this algorithm? Can I make it more efficient by doing these little tweaks? Yes, you can. You just made it way more efficient. It's still bad, but it's at least not so, so bad. You know, it's better. So yes, now you have bubble sort, I guess, 2.0. <laughs> so yes, basically two for loops nested and a comparison with an if statement and return true. This looks complicated, but if you really understand what it is, what the code is doing it is not complicated at all. It's literally just two for loops and an if statement. And that if statement has a swap in there, which is just calling a swap function, which is three lines of code. That's all it's doing. It's not too bad. Practice it. And then you will get to use this a little bit in assignment, uh, uh, I think it's 10. Is that the Twitter assignment? Yeah, that's the Twitter assignment. But that's not due for quite a while. So we can talk a little about that assignment next time. So uh, that's it. Are there any uh, questions? We, uh, we will talk next class about binary search and uh, more sorting stuff maybe. I wanted to really go slow today since we have the time to really... Uh, Make sure that you understand the sorting algorithms because it's a very uh, basic core thing of an application of an algorithm and converting that algorithm into code. Like this little fancy thing we're doing with the bubbling, how to translate that into code is an important skill that you should learn. When you get to 202 and 302, they tell you, I want you to code this sort of pattern or algorithm to do. And, and then you have to actually make that mental conversion from English language step-by-step -step process to actual code and it's not an easy thing it comes with practice yet again is the whole thing i was talking about coding is like writing that, I, that we read it's not something i came up with but we read it. it's a lot like writing and you could know you could know the dictionary from beginning to end but until you actually practice a lot of reading 
and a lot of writing, you're not going to learn how to connect two and two and make poetry, for example. So that's it. I guess I'll see you guys tomorrow then. Thanks for sticking around to class. I don't see any questions in here. So I guess we're all good to go. Get that assignment done. I believe right now you are in the middle of a battle royale assignment. I love that assignment. I am reusing that assignment from the past because I like it a lot. And yes, have fun. That one I did do. So you can ask me all the questions you want and I should be able to answer them easily. So just hit me up on Discord if you have questions on that assignment. Pretty fun, my favorite assignment I've ever made. So yes, have a good day guys. Bye.